Okay, so we're now re ready to start applying our uh, sampling theory that we developed in the previous couple of slides to uh, a couple of numerical experiments. So on a computer one can generate pseudo-random numbers, which is to say, say it's a set of numbers that have all the properties of random numbers, even though it is generated deterministically using some algorithm. Now, important information uh, to begin with here is that in its simplest form, uh, pseudo-random numbers as generated by computers are uniformly distributed, which is to say that within some pre-specified interval, uh, every value is equally likely. Okay, so to, so to illustrate the use of random numbers in numerical simulations, I'm going to do a fairly simple calculation where I estimate the value of pi. Now, if you have a circle with a radius of 1, the area of that circle is going to be just pi. Um, that circle can be inscribed within a square with, with sides 2 by 2, and the area of that square is therefore 4. So the ratio of the area of the, of, of the circle to that of the square is pi over 4. So what I'm going to do is to generate a series of pairs of random numbers, each of which fall between negative 1 and plus 1. And then f uh, for each pair, see whether that point falls inside or outside the circle. And I do that simply by taking the sum of squares and seeing whether it is, uh, value it is bigger than or smaller than 1. Now if one does that repeatedly and the likelihood of falling at any given point inside the square is equal, then the fraction of points that fall inside the circle can then give you an estimate of the value of pi. So what I did here was to generate 1 million xy points and for each one of them look at the distance that of that point from the origin. If that point falls inside the circle, which is to say its distance from the origin is smaller than or equal to 1, then I colored it blue. If I now add up all the blue points and I uh, determine what fraction it is of the red points, I can determine pi. Okay, so um, so what do we get? So firstly, let's just talk about the, the, the final answer I get. Using a million points, my estimate for the value of pi comes to 3.141236, which although is fairly close to the value of pi, is not particularly spectacular given that it's only accurate to the third digit and we can uh, track how this value of ours developed as we determined additional um, random points. Uh, so this red line is the actual value of pi, the blue line is our uh, running estimate of pi, and then this grey envelope is an error estimate that is determined using the fraction interval that we discussed in the previous lectures. And what is immediately apparent here is that we actually very quickly get to a value that's fairly okay, but from there on our accuracy does not really increase notably. And so then looking at the distance between these two lines, so the distance between the blue and the red line, so we see that once we reach an accu accuracy of around a thousandth, our estimate does not really improve that much. Now this behavior actually reflects the tendency of the variance in a proportion to go like the square root of 1 over the number of samples that it is based on, which is to say that it converges very slowly. If you want uh, to increase the accuracy of your fraction by an additional digit, you have to do 100 times more uh, random determinations. And that explains why our value is more or less at 10 to the negative 3 here, given that we've done a million samples. So, so if we wanted to get it to go to 10 to the negative 4, we would have to do 10 to the 8 um, calculations. Now, admittedly, this way of calculating pi is rather um, naive and certainly not very accurate. Um, and, and in fact, we can compare this accuracy that we got with um, historical estimates of pi. And so around 200 BC, the Greeks knew pi to about the third digit. Um, uh, around 400 AD, the Chinese mathematicians already knew pi up to five digits. Um, not long after that, Indian mathematicians knew it up to 11 digits. Newton calculated pi to 15 digits. And these days they are very rapidly convergent algorithms. For example, there's the Chudnovsky algorithm, which in a single iteration will give you 14 digits of pi. 
In fact, this algorithm was used to set the most recent record uh, for the number of digits to which pi has been calculated, uh, which was set in January 2019 and gave pi to 31.4 trillion digits. Now, what we actually did here was to calculate a, a, a probability in the sense that we were determining the probability of a point falling inside the circle given that the point has equal likelihood of falling in anywhere inside the square. Okay, so applying the same principle to a somewhat more sophisticated uh, problem, let's look again at the probability associated with a circle in standard normal space. So uh, you will recognize this as the same problem we treated at the end of the previous set of lectures. So what one can do is determine whether a given pair of x and y values sits inside or outside of the circle by determining their sum of squares and comparing it to the square of the radius of the circle. Now in this case, instead of the x and y values being uniformly distributed, uh, the pairs have the bivariate normal distribution. So what we do is we sample a million pairs of x and y values from that distribution and then for each pair look at whether it's inside of or outside of the circle and by determining the fraction of, of values inside the circle we can pr calculate the probability associated with that circle in the context of the uh, bivariate distribution that we have. N now by different far more accurate methods one can calculate that the actual probability that we're shooting for has that value and we can again contrast our our estimate to that value as a running mean value as we increase our number of samples. And you can see that our accuracy is again uh, fine up to the third digit, which is consistent with the fact that we uh, used a million points to determine that value. Now you'll recall from the previous lectures that the width of an interval on a uh, estimate for a proportion uh, is given by this expression. Uh, now by rearranging this expression we can determine the number of random samples that we need to take to get a desired accuracy reflected at some uh, desired uh, level of confidence. Um, so for example we might say that we want to know the proportion to within 10% uh, with a 95% confidence interval. So this then gives us the value for epsilon and this gives us the value for um, z of alpha over 2 and then depending on what we suspect this value will be uh, we can determine the value of n. Now in a reliability context p is very often quite uh, quite a small value so let's say it's about 10 to the negative 4 which translates into uh, the requirement for n being quite large so in general you'll need 10 n to be around a million to ten million. Now a direct implication of this requirement of n being very large when you're dealing with small probabilities is that if you're just going to blindly generate a, s a set of random numbers and for each one of them compute whether it satisfies a given criterion or not, that computation has to be very efficient for the calculation to be worth doing. Um, now I'm not going to get into uh, details about them in this series of lectures, but I, but I want to point out that there are more sophisticated, clever methods by which you can go about doing this, where instead of just following a brute force approach of repeatedly calculating a value, you uh, intelligently choose for which values to do the calculation. Um, these include more sophisticated sampling methods, uh, specifically Latin hypercube or Sobel sampling, as well as more intelligent ways of getting towards the answer, which include uh, subset simulation and uh, important sampling. Okay, so now let's look at how one can, one, one can generate random numbers that ha have some particular distribution. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, random numbers generated on a computer are, are pseudo-random, which is to say they have, they have the properties of random numbers, but they are deterministic in the sense that they are generated using an algorithm. And as a rule, these r random numbers are randomly distributed uh, f between 0 and 1. In that sense, we can use, view them as probabilities and then apply the inverse cumulative distribution function of our desired distribution to get to um, random variables that have that distribution. Now, specifically, let's look at how one can generate multivariate sets of correlated random variables. Um, 
So what one would do is first generate a set of individual values that follow a standard normal distribution. So any given instance of that can be represented through the vector u, representing a point in uncorrelated standard normal space. If one then specifies the correlation coefficients for your problem, you can set up the correlation matrix and perform Kolesky decomposition to, to come up with the lower triangular Kolesky matrix. Now that matrix then serves as a transformation matrix on the uncorrelated standard normal vector that, that introduces the effects of correlation and ends up giving you a, a vector of standard normal values which includes correlation. So to illustrate that in two dimensions, what I have on the left here is a random sampling of uncorrelated standard normal pairs and superimposed on this are the contours of the bivariate standard normal distribution. Uh, each one of these little dots therefore then represents a instance of the vector u. Now, now for this case I then specify that the correlation coefficient is minus 0 0.2 um, which then allows me to generate the uh, Kolesky matrix multiplying uh, each one of these u vectors with the L then gives me a corresponding z vector. So each one of these points then maps to a point over there. Um, and their distribution is, is, is again here illustrated using the contours of the correlated bivariate uh, normal distribution. So once you have the correlated standard normal vector, th the next step is to transform it to real coordinates, which is to say go from z to x. Now, if your random variables in real space are um, normally are, are also normally distributed, that transformation is straightforward to perform using the standardization equation. So, in the bivar so in the bivariate normal case, uh, this entire process um, can be summarized into this set of equations, where a given pair of uncorrelated standard normal values transform to correlated uh, standard normal values by the terms in the Kolesky matrix and from that you can then calculate the uh, corresponding x and y values. In the more general case where your random variables are not normally distributed, y you have to resort to using the isoprobabilistic transform, which is to say that once you have your z values you have to calculate the corresponding probability values of, of for each one of them and then take the inverse cumulative distribution function of that to get your individual x values. However, be careful when you do this and keep in mind the, the comments I made earlier um, regarding the behavior in the presence of large um, correlation.